nigga scared to make that move We can't relate to that I roll the dice, shit, if I lose, I'm gonna be shaken back Cause lessons learned within the loss Just elevate the fact that trial and error just the only way Ain't no escaping that I wake up, hit a hundred push-ups Then I'm at my route Check on my stocks, see how they looking Then I'm sliding out When you start seeing your progression You stop having doubts And what's the point of having clout If you can't cash it out True to this game, and I'm a lifer, ayy Feel like we finna change the cycle, ayy That's the most success, you know we thriving, ayy That's the most depression for our rivals, ayy Could teach a lesson on survival, ayy You know I'm from the bottom Welcome back, beautiful people You are now tapped into the Black Wealth Renaissance Podcast Show The greatest show on earth Let's get it <laughs> I am your boy, David Bellard, one of the founders of Black Wealth Renaissance, here with my brother, Jalen Clark. What's good, bro? What's up with it, my brother? It's your boy, Jalen Clark, another founder of the Black Wealth Renaissance. Man, how you doing today, dog? Man, I'm doing phenomenal, dog. I'm feeling good. I'm excited, bro. Anytime we get to pod, you already know, <laughs> spirits is high, the, yeah. the mood is lifted, and I'm ready to get into some game, man. Like, the guests we got today, Shh. long time pressure coming. <laughs> It's been a long time coming. Yes. I, I can't, I can't I was say about to say, I was, wait I was, a minute, I was, man. I was, I was you got talents, but singing is not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, man. I can sing a little bit. Just, just a, a little, little bit. bit. I can hold a note. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but y'all ain't come here to hear me sing. Unless y'all want to hear, you know, just drop a comment. You know, I, I might I might drop Please a track on y'all with that shit. <laughs> 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 no, nah, but... Uh, as always, y'all, y'all know we coming with another great installment of the Black Wealth Renaissance podcast. Before we introduce our guests, I have to ask y'all what I always do. Mm-hmm. Make sure y'all leave us that five star rating and review on the show to help us continue to grow and, and get this message out YouTube, there. And if you're on YouTube, click that notification bell. Subscribe. If this is your first time watching, go to the back catalog. Yeah. Hit the little like, too. Everything helps. It's free, and it helps us continue to go and help people learn this useful information. Now, as mentioned, y'all, as Jalen said, it's put put pressure, right? We got <laughs> another great guest on this show. Somebody that I said should have been on a while ago. Y'all may have seen her story on the internet. Uh, she is a mommy and a mogul. Mm-hmm. She is out here. She took a twelve hundred dollar stimmy, right, and turned it into a multi million dollar enterprise. Why y'all was eating <laughs> crab legs and <laughs> going to eat, Miami? Y'all took and that shit. stimmy and went to Miami. She took that stimmy and made some M's. <laughs> No, this, no, the, this is a little segue. Hold on. Before you, because <laughs> I saw some shit on Twitter that really pissed me oh, off, man. man. <laughs> These niggas said if 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 Biden send them this twenty thousand oh, dollars for that student loan, what they gonna do? They ain't gonna be paying it. And you know what? Y'all this, deserve to be broke. This gonna get a chain. Y'all deserve <laughs> to be broke. You don't deserve money or wealth if you do that dumb shit. That's all I had to say. Okay, so Jalen's rant is done. Um, but again, y'all, this is something like whenever we get opportunities like this, it's always somebody great to hear from somebody like this. She took full advantage of a small seed and grew a full tree. Uh, none other than Miss Ellie Jop, aka Ellie Talks Money. Ellie, welcome to the show. Thank y'all for having me. I'm super excited to be here. This is full circle because I've always wanted to be on this podcast. So, well, thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you for flying in. Appreciate you for coming through. Yes, yes, I'm excited. Yes, so. To get started, Ellie, um, I just kind of gave a brief intro to you, but I would like for you to just give the people an introduction to yourself before we get into everything. So uh, my name is Ellie, y'all. I am a mother of four. I'm just turned 30, so I'm 30 years old now, and I'm a business coach. I love to teach women how to start and scale businesses and show them how to secure funding so they can really build wealth, you know? Women-owned businesses and Black-owned businesses in particular receive the least amount of capital, period. Facts. It's like 4% compared to 55% on the other end. So it really needs to change. And I feel like this is my way of doing it. If I can show women and Black-owned businesses how to get the bag, then I can also show them how to flip it and how to build wealth and just do amazing things. So, yeah. And I'm from L.A., born and raised. I love it. I absolutely (laughs) love it. So, Ellie... I want to take it back to the beginning, right? So we going, your story started, I think you said you started in July of 2020. 2020. Yeah. Right? That's relatively a short period of time. It's what, a little over two years later now. Yeah. At the time of this recording. What were you doing before you got this $1,200 stimmy <laughs> and started this bit, started like giving out this game? 
Yeah, so let me take you guys back. So before, like 2019, I was working as director of sales for a financial services startup. So I had a team of like 100 people under me. We were selling life insurance and running TV commercials. So I was in this startup business. Mm -hmm. um, and I had helped that company get to like two or three million in revenue. So it was really dope. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was doing. Then I got laid off from that job. Because, you know, was it because of COVID or? Well, it was actually right pre COVID. And that was our sister company, my mm -hmm. CEOs. And, you know, they were based in the UK. And what he found was that the market here was just different. People mm -hmm. weren't as interested or educated on life insurance. It was a little harder to make the sales. And he just decided he was going to go back to the UK and keep doing it there. So, you know, it, was, it wasn't it was anything bad, but things just come to it's an end. It's a business end. decision. It's mm -hmm. a business decision, exactly. So at that time, I was also pregnant with twins. So I ended up giving birth to my twins in April of 2019. And then life just, everything changed. I ended up getting a divorce. My divorce was finalized January of 2020. Then I moved back home to my mom's house in Inglewood. So me and my four kids, so at that time, my twins were seven months, maybe seven or eight months. So I'm still nursing them. You know, they're babies. Mm -hmm. And so I find myself at home, four kids, divorce, no job, all, all the things. Damn. I know, yeah, damn. Like, yeah, <laughs> like, like, when it rains, a lot, of people, a lot of people will fold. <laughs> So all the things. So I'm applying to jobs because I'm like, okay, I have experience. Somebody should hire me. Mm -hmm. Guys, I applied to over 53 jobs and everybody said no. Yeah. I couldn't get hired. Yeah. I don't know what it was. So then I realized maybe this means I'm supposed to do something else. Maybe mm -hmm. I don't need to give my skills to a job. Maybe I need to figure out another place to give my skills. Maybe I need to give it to people. So that was what birthed my business. When I knew those stimulus checks were coming, I felt like this might be my only opportunity to get a free $1,200 in this condition, you know, because we were on welfare at the time. I was living at my mom's house, but I couldn't expect her to use her budget to cover me and four miles. That's a lot, you know. Um, so when that $1,200 came, I just felt like this is what I'm going to use to launch this business. And that's what we did. Awesome. Awesome. So before we even get into the business part. Yeah. I want to talk about the mindset because that's something that I believe is always important. How did you not allow your situation to confine you and you didn't victimize yourself? Because I think that's something that a lot of people do yes. whenever they get a strike of bad luck or something yes. like that. They, they, they play the victim role and they don't allow themselves to rise up out of those situations. Yeah, that's such a good point. And I feel like, you know, I was there for a little bit, right? when everything kind of came crashing down. I'm at, you know, looking at my kids, just seeing everything that I had, I didn't have anymore. It's very easy to slip into that place of why is this happening to me, mm -hmm. right? But through a lot of prayer and just really reflecting and thinking about the fact that things don't happen to you, they happen for you, mm -hmm. you know? And it took me some months to get to that point, but I realized God wouldn't have brought me back to the beginning if I wasn't supposed to grow again you know we often have to look at our darkest days as you know a testimony to what we're able to survive and I realize if I can get through this then that means I'm meant to survive and meant to do something great so that's really what got me through you know and a quote that I found at that time was if you're in a dark place and it seems like you've been buried, perhaps you've been planted. Mm -hmm. So bloom. And so quote by? I don't know. I'm telling you, I was just, yeah, I was just, yeah, I was scrolling one day and it just showed up and it, I made it my screensaver. And literally that was my uh, screen thing for like a year because it really kept reminding me, like I haven't been buried I'm just planted right now. This is the opportunity. I just got to keep going. I got to grow. I got to grow. So that really got me through. And then, you know, my kids, right? I think that a lot of the times, especially when I work with women entrepreneurs now, it can feel like our kids are a burden, right? Let's just be honest. I don't know if y'all have kids, but no, kids, yeah. no not, yet. not yet. Okay. Not yet. <laughs> you know, sometimes when you're trying to make life happen, it can be a challenge, you I know, you, you got to take, yes. take care of yourself or two or three or, or four. four. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there were moments where I was feeling like, this is just, it's heavy. Why? 
but they really became my motivation, you know? And when I was so afraid to try to do this business, I decided that instead of being afraid of what could happen with this business, maybe nobody was going to like my post on Instagram, maybe nobody's going to buy. All of those things were scary. But what was more scary was still seeing my kids in the same place in a year or Mm. two years, still being on EBT in a year or two years. Like that was more scary to me. And so looking at it that way, I felt like, what do I have to lose? If you're already at the bottom, you can't go anywhere else but up. You really can't. So that that mindset and seeing it that way made me feel like I don't have anything to lose because I already lost it all. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. Because like when you said that thing about being stagnant, like being stagnant is one of the scariest things you can do in this world. Just imagine staying in the same place, doing the same things year after year after year and not getting any of the things that you know you desire not literally going after anything that's that's like living hell basically it is that's a living hell so i wanted to go back to that seed analogy that you put out there like you've been buried you've been buried you haven't been buried you've been planted so with that 1200 dollars seed that you received <laughs> how did you plant that and start growing yeah um this multi-million dollar enterprise <sighs> wow i feel like you know, twelve hundred dollars is not a lot of money. In right? the grand scheme of things, like, at all. yeah, we know that could be gone in three days. In twenty, let your car break down. It'll be gone. That's, in that's gone the same day. Day. <laughs> right? Thanks. We, especially with these guys' prices, it's not a lot of money. But what I realized was that the information I had, mm-hmm. I didn't have to pay for it because I already had it. Right? I just needed the twelve hundred to help me get it out there a little bit better. So I took that and basically invested in my ability to create content. You know, a part of it went towards buying a ring light. A part of it went towards upgrading my iPhone. I paid for my website and some domains. I filed my LLC. So by the end of all those things, I had a couple hundred dollars left, which I saved on the side. Because, you know, pages like mm-hmm. Black Wealth Movement and others used to charge $25, $50 to post. And so I would use it for that, you know, just so every so often to get me in front of people. And then the rest of it was me. You know, I just posted three to four times a day, every day, live, every live day. Value. Two times a day, live. Three times a day, sometimes going in live because I realized that the 1200 couldn't go very far but I could you know I could go very far I could treat this like it was a job and I didn't make a lot of money fast you know it's not like it all happened in the first three months I probably didn't hit my first five figures until maybe four or five months in but then once I got going it was up from there. we went from five to seven very quickly but that's powerful, just that consistency piece there. You spoke yes. of, like, that getting the content out there and how you mentioned leverage and influencer marketing. I think so many times people, they want to kind of, like, kickstart their brand, right? Right. And they don't want to have that money to start putting it out there. Because, don't get me wrong, you can go out and be consistent, but you're going to have to add a little fuel to that fire. And then once you get the algorithm behind you, it's like, oh, people following this page, people are engaging with this person. Yes. Let me push them out there even more. So, like... The organic piece comes from, like, you providing value, but also from you having, putting your brand out there through other avenues. Because if you don't have an audience, you're going to have to leverage somebody else's audience. Exactly. Other people's audiences. And that really worked for me. Like, one of the strategies that I use at the time is when I would post, right? So I would pay for someone to post, like Black Millionaires, for example. I think it used to be like $50. Mm -hmm. And I would time it. So they let you know what time they're going to post to you. And so when I knew the post was going up, I would wait about 20 minutes after the post went up because then there's probably people coming back and forth to my page. They're looking. And I would go live. And I would use that moment right Mm -hmm. then when I knew I had all this new traffic to go live or to post a piece of content that was really valuable on my own page. So then you convert those lookers into buyers or at least into followers. Right. And you can end up selling them later. So that was my strategy. I was like, if I'm going to use this twenty five dollars, knowing I don't have a whole lot, I need to make sure I maximize this exposure one thousand percent. And that's something people have to pay attention to. You know, I didn't know how to do Facebook 
podcast. It was a foreign language to me, but I knew how to pay shout out pages. And I can definitely say it helped me at least to get to my first 5,000 followers. So whenever you're you're doing this right, how are how did you figure out, okay, this is going to be the value that I'm going to be adding? Yeah. How did you figure out, okay, I'm going to take the business coach route and yeah. I'm going to teach them the things that I've learned in my prior years? Yeah. So, you know, something I thought so much about is like when I was working at my corporate job, I was the only, pretty much the only black woman, right? Mm -hmm. And the only black woman in any type of leadership. So I was the only one talking to my CEOs, to the marketing department, HR. And there was so much I was learning there. And it made me think, this like my the previous company I worked for, they were so successful because they got a lot of capital. Mm -hmm. They got a lot of funding. They had a lot of investor backing. They were always updating and revising the business plan. And so it made me think about this company is able to succeed because they have millions of dollars in other people's money. They have millions of dollars of capital. And, you know, when I was just doing a little market research, when I was trying to find a job, it became so apparent to me that a lot of our businesses, small black owned businesses have none of that. Most of us fail because we can't find funding. Exactly. I think Nine out of 10 in the first five years have no capital, have no backing, don't have a business plan, don't have investors, you know? And so when I started thinking about what could I package up, I just made a list of all the things I really knew how to do, like that I could really talk about, that I could really show someone how to do, that I felt confident in, and I wanted to stick to that. And so on that list was things like funding, sales, leadership, management, you know, just different things that if it worked for that startup environment, then it could probably work for other small business startups mm -hmm. too. And I just started to create content, you know, a big part of it actually, and this is something a lot of people have to do when you're looking for what type of content to create, go and look up like your competitors, so to speak, on social media and read their comments. There's a lot of unanswered questions in the comment she section. Is giving game <laughs> bars. There's a lot of unanswered questions in the comment section. And that's no shade to those people. They're no, busy. It, it, that's a fact. People are busy, but like you're saying, people are literally telling you, you what they want to know. You can feel that you. void that they're not. They not are literally care. telling you right there. And so I paid attention. I started to literally create a spreadsheet of all the different questions and comments that I was seeing in people's pages and, you know, what they were looking for. And what I noticed was that there were a lot of people out there talking about business and funding or different things, but none of them looked like me. Mm -hmm. None of them were mothers. None of them had experienced what I had experienced. And so I felt like that's my angle. You know, I'm going to come out and show women and moms hey you can start over and here's how right here's how you should structure your business here are some things to pay attention to and we made it work from there so I think so much of the time people think about oh there's so many other people doing what I'm doing there's mm -hmm. too much competition but there's really not any competition because there's nobody who can do it exactly the way that you can you just have to focus on what are they not doing and you come and do that it. This is a habitual <laughs> gem dropper, guys. I just want y'all to know. So we talking about funding, right? Yeah. And I definitely want to get into that because you definitely provide on social media a lot of free game just for people to get funding for their businesses. Can you refer uh, or just kind of speak on some of the different funding sources that black people, small black businesses, listeners of this podcast yeah. kind of go to yeah. to get started? I would definitely say... A great place for y'all to start is with business credit mm -hmm. in general. And so making sure that you have some different relationships with like a big bank, like a Chase or Bank of America, but then also a credit union, a credit union in your state is preferable because having those relationships with these two types of institutions is going to give you the opportunity to get funding from either one. You know, credit unions typically have I want to say easier qualifications to get the bag than bigger banks. And so because of that, you have an opportunity there to gain leverage mm -hmm. as well. When it comes to your business credit, some companies that a lot of businesses can get approved with right now, whether they have good credit or not, are like Clear Co. And that is specifically for e-commerce businesses or people that sell online, but they don't even ask you for your social security number. So that can be is a great Clear Co. Clear Co. Mm hmm. Yeah. They don't so ask. Like so that's no, no personal, PG. Yeah, no, no PG personal. at all. 
You can literally go and apply and they will pre-approve you in 10 minutes. Wow. Yes. So write that down, y'all. So you can definitely go there. Um, I think another one that I often recommend is Blue Vine. Which you probably heard about, but they really do have, have some good actually, programs. Have, oh no! Okay, I have not. I'm breaking out my notes right Hello. now. Y'all should do the same. <laughs> um. Blue Vine is really good because you can have about you know a 600 credit score and still have the opportunity. I also recommend um, CDFIs or CFDIs, which are community development financial those, yeah. institutions. Yes, those are so great. Because they're for the community. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the time people don't think about it because they're only focusing on these big name credit cards. But those that's money directly in your city. There's typically one or two locations in every major city that is for businesses in your area. And all you need is to have your business registered be able to show that you've been building business credit. And, you know, they're going to ask you some questions about what your business is going to do with the money. And there's a bag right there. The acronym one more time. CFDI. Yeah. And if you search CFDI near me, yeah, it'll pop up. So those are some really good options, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, and really making sure that, you know, what every black owned business needs is better bookkeeping. (laughs) (laughs) You get into some shit that they don't want to hear. And, you know, I think it's it's crazy because, like, we hear that, right? And. We hear bookkeeping and people get like, oh I know God, it's so hard. Bro, yes. Buy QuickBooks. That's it. It's easy. <laughs> buy QuickBooks. You can do it yourself. Or what, it's going to take you a little. You can typically get somebody a month to do it for you. Once you start making a little Probably money. Like, like 300 or even less. Yeah, like $300 a month. So for somebody to come in and keep all your books in order. Sometimes $50 a week even like it's worth it. It's worth it. And the reason why is because y'all remember in 2020 when we had all those like PPP loans and EIDL Ooh, they loans. They're getting in trouble now. Oh, Lord. Listen, I, uh, but there were a lot of our businesses who couldn't even Legitimate qualify. Businesses. Yes, because, because we didn't have people. receipts. There wasn't a business bank account. Everything was on Cash App or Zelle. Get on them Cash App Cathy's and then Venmo Veronica. <laughs> you know how I feel about Cash App Cathy. Everything was on Venmo, you know, and that cause a lot of good businesses i mean Mm -hmm. restaurants i saw a lot of businesses in inglewood in my community just because it just wasn't clean you know and that's the biggest thing we can improve on is having your business bank account Mm -hmm. having an account for expenses keeping your receipts you're talking now people don't understand the importance of having multiple bank accounts as well that's something that we've learned from profit first um, because we're big on having multiple bank accounts for our personal, like just personal finances. But same thing applies to business. Yeah. Have your income account, have your operation expenses account, exactly. have an account just for your taxes, exactly. have an account for your profit. Like if you have all little separate accounts, is, uh, how do you, what was that term? Uh, that? Bank account accounting. Yeah. Shout out to Suzanne. Like whenever you put all your money in one big pot, you fall victim to the habit of looking at it, being like, Oh, I oh, can I got afford it. this. Exactly. Because, like, if you got $30,000 sitting in this one account, yeah, it might look like you can afford it, but can you really afford it? But can you really afford it? And there's a big difference between revenue and profit. Talk about it. And I feel like people think what's coming in is the same as what's staying. And it's, it's not. not. You don't have if you're, expenses as a business owner. Yes. And if you're not paying attention to what's going out, you will very quickly find yourself at zero, basically, And now you're in a position where you need to go get funding because you don't have cash flow. Mm. And that's the biggest reason why our businesses tend to not succeed is because we lack capital and we lack cash flow. I kind of want to get on that, too. So, you know, even whenever you're showing you're negative or you're hitting zero, it makes it harder to get funding as well, because now it's looking like you're not making money that you're bleeding. And why would I want to fund someone who's not even making money? Exactly. The best time to get funding is when you don't need it. The best time to go and get the bag is when things are good. When you got a little money from month to month, that's when, you know, it's time to run it up. I could understand that. Yeah. Why would I want to lend to you when you're struggling? When you're struggling. Exactly. And it's always better to get the funding and not need it and then have it already Mm -hmm. when you do need it. That's the best thing. But a lot of people wait 
until it's too late or until they're in that situation and it's so much harder than you know or the interest rate that they give you is crazy because they know how much you need it you know so doing those things early like having separate accounts having expenses keeping your receipts stop using cash app and zelle and venmo instead send an invoice Send a Stripe, send a PayPal even, send a QuickBooks invoice. It's so much better because when you use those payment processors, not only is it actually documented as business income for your account, which you need, but as well, you start getting capital with QuickBooks. Mm -hmm. You start getting capital with Stripe. So they will lend to you as well based on the amount of transactions that you're running through their server. And now you're able to qualify for that. And that's also no PG. Mm -hmm. But if you're not using any of those, then you know you're missing out on two bags, essentially. And we can't afford that. Can't be missing these bags. Can't be missing these bags. So I'm glad we're talking about personal guarantee versus like pure business credit, right? Yeah. So whenever someone's just starting out, do you recommend that they personally guarantee anything for to start business credit? Or <sighs> would you recommend them kind of just going to one of those other vendors like a clear or yeah. a cabbage or one of those? I think that if you have good personal credit, use it. Mm-hmm. You know, if you have the ability, for example, some business credit cards like Amex, Chase, you really can't get it unless you give them your social, Mm -hmm. right? So in those cases, if you can do it, it gets you in the the club. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It gets you in the door. And then once you're in, you're in, you don't need to keep using your social every time. And it only reports to business credit. I would say that if you're in a position and you don't have this, you know, personal credit that's required, then yes, you want to do some more creative funding. But the thing people need to understand is if you're going to go to a lender that's not going to ask you for high personal credit, they are going to look for you to have clean books. Mm -hmm. It's one or the other, right? So if your credit is not together, your books got to be popping. If your book's not popping, you got to have good credit, right? It's you gonna one ha- the other. It's one or the other, you know? So you definitely do have options. Like when I started to build my business credit, I had a 540 personal credit score. So I couldn't really do mm. the kind of things. PG. That's why I'm so mm-hmm. passionate about teaching people how to build business credit, even if they don't have good personal credit. And what really helped me is when I first got my Chase business credit card, I did it by building a relationship at the bank and basically just continuing to talk to her, continuing to let her know what my goals are. And, you know, that's something people shouldn't sleep on is relationships are everything. So they basically manually approved my card off the strength of that mm. relationship, you know, because right. the system declined me straight like that. But she was like, well, let me put you on the phone with the underwriter. And I told him, like, listen, I just got a divorce. I have four kids. I'm at my mom's house. I just need this card. So those things happen. But if you're not in your branch, if you're not really using your bank account to its full extent, you might not get that type of opportunity. So it's super important to have clean books, but also really build relationships with the people that handle your money. Because that bank is an asset to you more than you are an asset to that bank. Mm. Sheesh. Bars. You, you, you spitting. <laughs> and while we're still on the topic of funding, I want to talk about leveraging the business credit. Yeah. Once you get the funding, right, a lot of people are like, okay, now I got access to $20,000. What do I do with it? Yeah. So what was some things that you done and what are some things that you can do to actually leverage that funding once you have access to it? Yes. So I always say that you need to get the bag, split the bag, and then you need to flip the bag. Okay. You're going to have to run it back one time. I understand getting it. One time. Yes, you have to get it, split it, and then flip it. So so what I always say is getting the bag is what we just talked about, right? Mm-hmm. Your business credit, these lines of credit. Now, the most important thing is something I always teach my students is when you get capital, don't just put it all in one place. You need to split that up and go and use it to create another stream of income. That's good. Mm-hmm. You have to, right? Because every billionaire always uses OPM. The first billionaire didn't even exist until the banking and credit system were created because Mm -hmm. they were able to, yeah, they were able to leverage the bank's money to go and get more income producing assets and then bloop, billionaire status, just like that. So get in the bag is what we talked about. Then you split the bag, right? So something I like to do is let's say you get a $50,000 business loan. 
you take a portion of that and you use the loan to pay back the loan. So let's say your payment is $500 a month. So you set aside about $12,000. That's going to cover your payment for two years. Mm. Now you're working with $38,000. So it seems like less, but... In fact, you're just give, you're future proofing yourself for two years. So now you have this thirty eight thousand. Go ahead and put twenty k into your business ads, marketing, content, whatever you need to do. That other eighteen k, that's what we're about to flip. So now you look at all right, what are some income producing assets I can acquire with 18K? I teach my students how to get Airbnbs with that money. Now you just set something up that can make you at least $3,000 a month passively. You could also get vending machines. You could also go buy a car or two used car and put them on Turo. That's gonna make you a thousand or two thousand dollars a month. And so you flip that bag because you leverage that OPM, that 18K that you wouldn't have had otherwise. And now you just came out with a whole other stream of income or mm. two streams of income. And this is how we build wealth. You see what I'm saying? Because if we only focus on getting money and putting it into one place, Yes, that one place might do well, but one stream of income, even if it's a business, is too close to none. You got to diversify. You have to diversify, and you should always diversify with somebody else's money, not with your own money. Mm. Talking that shit. Yeah, 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 I'm telling you, man. <laughs> Get the black. That, that, is a, that is a gem right there. Get the bag, split it, and flip it. Like, creating multiple streams of income is definitely a necessity in that. Yes. And you talked about the Airbnb, so now I kind of just wait, wait, wait. Before oh, you go, no, 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 no. still some more funding that I got to get into. Okay. Because you talked yes. about business credit, yeah. but lately you've also been talking about grants. Mm -hmm. and that's okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm going yeah. to leave you. I'm going to leave you. Be. <laughs> I got the Airbnb on the list, though. <laughs> you did, you did. <laughs> but I, I want to talk about grants because that's another layer, another way that you can get funded. Yeah. So can we go into what is a grant? Yes. And then how do you start acquiring those grants? Yes, that's so good. Grants are free money. And I love grants and everyone should love grants for that. And I, I feel like, right. I feel like in our community, people think grants are like a scam or they're not real. Why? Why because do we it, always think something is a scam? I think it's because to them, it sounds too good to be to true. To be true, Why yeah. would they just give, give me money? Give me money, right. But it's like kind of going back to so you said those government those incentivized. CFBIs, exactly. right? But they have to give this money to you. Exactly. That's their job. And you have to think of it as grants are essentially tax write-offs to the government or these private institutions. So, for example, when Walmart is giving away millions of dollars at the end of each year, Yes, maybe it's because they care about the community, but also they're getting millions of dollars as a tax write-off because they're giving it away. So that money is going to be available every year, whether you like it or not, and you might as well get prepared for how to go and get it. So grants are free money, and there's government grants, there's corporate grants, and then you know federal grants, and then as well like smaller, more community-based grants. But you can get all the grants, right? There's no limit to the money that you can or can't get. I think what a lot of people don't realize is that in order to get approved for the grant, you just need to have a good grant proposal, right? Mm -hmm. Because of the fact that it's free money, you know, when you're getting a business loan or a line of credit, they just want to look at your score. They want to see what your numbers look like. They want to see if you have good credit. And then basically they give you the money. With a grant, they want to understand what is the quality behind your business? Like, mm -hmm. what is the mission? What is the purpose? You got to believe in that mission. Exactly. How does this make a specific community better? Right? And so... I always encourage my audience, you know, don't look at your business as just a small business, right? It might be small for right now, but you can have a big purpose. You can have a big mission. And when you're writing your grant proposals, the first section that they're going to look at is your mission statement. And that's where you should be able to clearly show, you know, our business helps these community of people to achieve xyz and this is how we do it right so the who the what and the how is very important and when you can really clarify that well and then show how that grant money is going to be used in a budget 
that I mean, those two ingredients are really key to helping you win. Right. Mm -hmm. Because of the fact with a business line or a business loan, they're not really going to ask you too much about how you're going to use the money. But with a grant, they want to see that budget. Mm -hmm. Where is this five thousand going? Where is this three thousand going? And so it really gives you the opportunity to plan ahead as well as a business owner to increase your chances of actually getting that money. It's it's just too it's a too amazing mm -hmm. the fact that this is out there. And for black owned businesses specifically, mm -hmm. we have the Minority Business Development Agency, which exists in every city, every major city. You also have the National Association for the Self-Employed, which give away grants every single month. There's also government grants in your state, state grants that you can look up through the Chamber of Commerce. A really, a lot of it is just going out and seeking the information because it is there. Mm -hmm. So with these, um, these minority... I'm sorry, what, can you repeat it again? Minority Business Development Agency. Minority minority Business Development Agencies and these associations for the self-employed. Yeah. Are there any certifications or anything that business owners need to get prior to walking in there? You're talking about kind of like how government contracting mm -hmm. have to be, like HUD status and all of that? Right. Yeah. So for the Minority Business Development Agency, no, you do not. Once you, you know, apply with your business, you do have to be at least 50% minority owned, mm -hmm. but that is something that you can basically prove upon sending in your application. Now, other types of government grants that you can get through like SAM.gov or Grants.gov, then you do want to go and register as a minority owned business in the sam.gov database which is also going to open you up to government contracts right mm -hmm. and so that's really key i think much of the time people when they start these businesses they just start them but registering for things like the u.s chamber of commerce as a black owned business the other one um what is it the caucus the black caucus for the you know what i'm talking about I'm I've heard it of it before, phone. but the National you, Black Caucus? Yeah, you can register there as a black owned business too. I have it in my notes because I just did it this week. So those are other opportunities, but and those things are free, you know. Registering mm -hmm. your business as a minority owned business doesn't cost you any money. And I think people think it does or that you have to be in some certain crew to do it. But it's just a matter of going to Google and getting it done. So those do give you additional opportunities to get funding, um, to get grants. But some of the larger grants we know about are these private grants with FedEx, Visa, LinkedIn has a grant. Um, Nav.com has a grant. I'm pretty sure Amazon got a damn grant. Exactly. American Express has a grant. They give away like 250000 to several people every single year. Comcast has a grant. Um, Essence has a grant. The NAACP has grants. So, you know, one thing that's really helpful, right, is to just hire someone to look all them up for you. So if you go to Fiverr.com, F-I-V-E-R-R.com. <laughs> you ain't even going to break the bank. Exactly. Go to Fiverr.com. You can hire a research assistant for $10 an hour. Five hours of research is what? $50. And tell them, I need you to go find me all of the grants for black-owned, women-owned, or minority-owned businesses that are going to be coming due in 2023. I need the names, the due dates, the websites, the qualifications. They will bring you a list of 50 to 100 different grants. And now you have the information right in front of you. And you can also hire someone to write the grants if that's you the want. That's part that I wanted to get into. Because yeah. I think that's another part that keeps people in our community from Doing pursuing it. the grants mm. is the grant writing. They yeah. think, okay, I don't even know how to do this shit. Because I, I don't understand grant writing. Right. So like. <laughs> I know you stated you just have to have a strong proposal and mission yeah. statement and stuff, but like, is it a certain amount of pages you have to have for grant writing? Yeah. Like, so it kind of depends. Like I give templates in my course. So I give my grant writing templates, which are basically the grants that I have written that have won. I just make it easy for y'all to fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. But generally your grant proposal will be like three to five pages normally. 
that's incredibly short in the grand scheme of things, right? It like, is. How many papers did you have to write Man. when you were in school? Exactly. That were and research one, papers? Yeah, yeah, one whole page is your budget. So it's really like four pages or two pages, depending, you know? Um, and now a lot of grants are online. It used to be that you had to like type this whole thing and send it in via email or via mail. But now you can answer the application questions. And a lot of grants are accepting video submissions, like the FedEx grant and the oh. NAV grant. They want to see you talk about your business. So we can all do that. We're on camera right now, you know? You never learn. <laughs> so, so that's the thing. Like, most of them are going to be three to five pages. Some of them will be longer than that. Mm -hmm. But the real key is just being able to, like I said, communicate what your business does, who it helps, and how it helps them. And then finding a proofreader on fiverr.com finding someone to you know kind of add in the the sauce for the mm -hmm. grants can cost you 250 dollars. don't pay somebody three thousand dollars to write your grant don't do it and as well at the minority business development agency they have free business advisors who will review your grant proposals and make edits for you see so if you don't have the money and chances are you got the time Except and if you got the time you need to spit, send your ass, take your ass on down to your advisor yes. and get that free advice. And get that free advice. There is so much stuff out there when you just look for it. And I realize we spend a lot of time on our phones. We spend a lot of time maybe watching TV. We spend a lot of time going out. And if we take inventory of the time that we spend doing everything else that doesn't involve making more money in our business, we actually have so much mm -hmm. time to do the things that are necessary to make more money in our business. It's just a mindset shift. You know, it's easy to do what's comfortable. Mm. It's not easy to go and start writing grants for the first time because it's not comfortable. But that's where growth happens and that's where profit happens too because this money will get sent back if it doesn't go to us mm -hmm. you know why not just go get it and then they, when they redo the budget next year they'll be like well they ain't go get it they this didn't time go get so, it and they'll so find i guess we ain't gonna need to put it there this exactly. time exactly they will reallocate the funds and it will, you remember how in 2020 2021 there was so much money coming well, at small mm -hmm. black owned businesses because it was in the news and it was the just George very Floyd situation. Exactly. It was people were paying attention to it. Well, this year those budgets look a lot different because even with all the money that was set aside, there were still millions of black owned businesses who didn't take advantage because they either just didn't know or they just didn't want to be uncomfortable. So we need to always show up in large numbers in order for them to keep those budgets high. It's really important. Okay. <laughs> habitual gym job <laughs> so no we talked you talked about the airbnb and when you're talking about flipping the bag diversifying uh off camera before we got on the show i, I, I sometimes i wish y'all could be a part of these conversations you know, a little the fly on the wall one, one of the one <laughs> hey, of these man, days that might be a podcast the fly on the wall oh i like uh, okay, that uh, uh, what are we gonna do? Put like a little camera? Uh, no, I, I'm getting distracted. <laughs> 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 so uh no, you mentioned starting airbnbs in senegal where your fat where your father's from yes so can you kind of talk about that process like yes. i mean we've had people talk about airbnbs out here is it any different starting a business like that in a different country um there are some things that are different and i want to say that like there's so much opportunity in west africa like there's so much opportunity there the types of returns you get on investment you don't see that here in the u.s mm -hmm. and the fact that you know, that's our roots. That's right. our history, right? We got to not think that the only place to make money is the yeah. USA because mm -hmm. money is definitely money everywhere, right? So with Airbnbs internationally, the process is a little different in that, of course, there might be a language barrier. So that's one thing, right? But it's a lot easier actually out there because you don't necessarily need to go and form a business entity before getting started, right? So one of the key things you're going to do is establish your residency. And the way that you establish your residency is to get an apartment in your name. So I still do the rental arbitrage method that I do here in America out there. But being that I'm able to secure the apartment in my name, that allows me to establish residency, which allows me to open bank accounts there. 
there, right? Mm. So that you have better relationships on the ground. Now you are able to get different pricing and discounts because you have residency in that country. And the profit margins are crazy, right? So, for example, one of my units there is three bedrooms, three bathrooms, five minutes walking from the beach. It's beautiful. It's $700 a month. Wait a minute. Three beds? Three beds? Three beds. beds. Three baths, balcony. That for myself. That's all I said. Seven hundred dollars a month, which you know, that's that's, that's cheaper than a, a one bedroom Nigga, studio apartment in downtown. Yeah, dog. that's like some people's car payment here. Facts. And but your profit margins, because remember, the people that are coming are tourists, mm-hmm. so they're spending tourist money. So it's seven hundred dollars a month, but easily we list it for. Right now, it's at $122 a day, which isn't even a lot. I was about to say, that's still cheap. That's still cheap. I could definitely do it more, but I want volume, right? Mm -hmm. So 100, let's call it $150 a day. Over a month, what is that, 4,000? Is that almost 4,000? 3,500? Yeah, I'm going to have to break out the calculator on you. Something like that. Yeah, something, something like that. But, I'm going to let know, calculate a man. Yeah, do that's, like a $3, that's like a $3,000 profit margin, yeah. right? Passive. Now, the way that you make it passive, and this is why... I always encourage people to set something up internationally is because when you have business operations in another place, every time you travel there, it's a tax write off. Mm. So uh, why not go? Right. So when you decide, let's say, you know, you want to do Ghana, maybe you want to do Europe, maybe you want to do Brazil, maybe you want to come to Senegal with me. I'll connect you with all my people. Every time you take that trip, it's a tax write off. And finding the people on the ground is actually the easy part because you first want to connect with a realtor. Just the same way we have realtors here, they have realtors there, and they are going to get a small commission for finding you an apartment, so they're motivated to find you one. Then you ask them to put in place your property manager, your cleaner, your security guard. It's always just a cultural thing to have that there. And anything else you might need, and so that becomes your go-to person. And just the same way we would pay a property manager here, you'll pay someone there to take care of it. But the salary difference is huge, right? So here you might have to pay someone $500 a month, but there a hundred dollars a month is, that's a lot of money to people, you know? So, so they're grateful to you and you have this relationship and it's a win-win by just going and taking that first step. Mm -hmm. So I always tell people, you got to have, you got to have Airbnbs in your portfolio. And when you have the opportunity, you got to go and get one internationally because not only, is it great? But now I have visibility into the real estate market there. And again, land is a finite resource. Mm-hmm. So the same way real estate is valuable here, it's even right. more mm-hmm. valuable there. And it appreciates 10 times as fast as it does in the U.S. Mm. So question, whenever someone's setting up this international operation, yeah, do you advise them to actually go there first to put their eyes on everything to before they actually start taking off. I would say that if you have never been there and you don't know anyone there, yes, it would be a good idea to go cuz you want to make sure you like this country before you just set up a unit there for other people to go to. You mm-hmm. know, if you don't even like it, it's not going to make sense. But if you have been there or you know someone who has been there or you have some sort of connection there on the ground, you don't necessarily need to go. For example, one of my students just set one up in Costa Rica. She had never Man, been to Costa Rica. I heard Costa Rica like hot yes, spot. Hot spot. <sighs> Big hot spot. So she took my class, set one up in Costa Rica. She ended up going after the unit was already set up. But again, that process of finding realtors on the ground, connecting with them, you know, adding a little sweetness into their pot, right, in exchange for them setting things up, closed mouth, don't get fed. You know, and I have found in my business and in life that the more you give to people, the more you end up receiving on the back end, you know, so a lot of new opportunities that I'll come across is because I gave to them first. And so even if I'm giving a couple extra hundred dollars to this realtor, I know I'm going to win on the back end. Right. And now we have that mutual trust. Mm -hmm. So I definitely think you don't need to go first, but you do need to have some knowledge of that country. Adding boots on the ground to make sure that you make it. Exactly. Everything is copacetic. Exactly. Everything is copacetic. Make sure you like it. Make sure it's cute. 
I, I, mean, I, I got you, so many things I want to go into. I ain't gonna lie. I, I don't want to take all early day. <laughs> I got so many things I want to go no, into. No, it's good. Um, so I kind of want to go into the digital product side of things, right? Okay. I think that's a great avenue for people to start creating revenue by yes. monetizing that knowledge, right? So you mentioned it earlier in the episode. You looked at the things that you were confident in. You realized I could speak about this, this, and this, and I can educate somebody on this. So when it comes to creating digital products, you turn, again, a $1,200 <laughs> STEMI into a multi-million dollar enterprise. Now, yeah. granted, you diversify it. But when it comes to build, creating a successful digital product, can you provide some insight on that? Yes. So digital products are the wave. It is going to be, I think, the it's already a billion-dollar industry. Yeah. But by 2030, it's supposed to raise up another, I think, $100 billion by mm-hmm. then. I mean, That's crazy. And I think the crazy. pandemic just accelerated it. It accelerated so that. I was looking at the numbers, too, po- pre-pandemic yes and like you stated it was a billion dollar and it was supposed to go up to like 200 300 billion dollars at the time that you're stating but yeah pandemic just accelerated it a accelerated lot of that, that and that was happening so fast i mean everyone is learning differently and really the new you know the new avenue of making money, it's not that your degree is not important, but now everything is based on your skill set. If you mm-hmm. have a skill set and something unique that you can show people and that you can teach people, college degree or not, you can get a bag. Mm-hmm. So what I want people to know about digital products is yes, digital products are ebooks, courses, but they're also subscriptions. They're also selling templates, printables, recipes, music, videos, you know, digital is anything that is online that is a transfer of information. That's a digital product. So you got to look at, all right, make your list. What are some things that you know you're good at? What are some things that people always ask you for advice on? That's like a key, right? If someone's always coming and asking you for advice on how to edit videos or how to lose weight or how to save money, if, if you, you know, if people are willing to get this advice for you for free, They'll somebody else is willing it. to pay for you. Somebody else is willing to pay for it, you know? So start there, look at that list. And then from that list, look at, okay, What's the best way for me to deliver this information? Am I better in writing? Write an ebook. Am I better on video? Create a little mini course. Do I want to make money residual, right? Have a $20 membership where you teach classes to people every month on Zoom. People will pay for what they know is available. But if nobody knows that you have this knowledge, if they don't know you, they can't flow you, you know? Mm-hmm. So you've got to put the product out there. And, you know, that's how my business scaled so quickly. Because I started by doing one-on-one coaching, mm-hmm. talking to people on the phone, right? But then you only have so much time. Yeah. 24 hours in a day. You only have so much time. And I realized, hmm, I could take exactly what I'm saying on the phone and put it into a product. Mm-hmm. And when I did that... It just, it allowed me to go from one to one to one to many. And that's how you have to look at digital products is you are expanding your ability to influence thousands of people at the same time. And you really only do the work once. It's Mm. crazy. High ticket or low ticket? What's your preference? Uh, See, I believe that you need to have a combination of both. But I believe that low ticket creates more accessibility to you Mm -hmm. and it's a better way to, you know, let's face it, more people can spend $200 on a product than $1,000 on a product or $5,000 on a product. And I know my success has come from like my first product was $15. And I'm not saying anybody should have their product that low. I was new. I was trying to figure it out. But when people can easily access your products and there's no big barrier to entry and your product is good, then the referrals go crazy. Mm -hmm. Hey, get it. It's only 50 bucks or it's only 75 bucks or it's only 100 bucks, Mm -hmm. you know. And so that allows you to grow on a massive scale. Now, I also do have some high ticket things, but you have to go through an application process to get there, right? So for those who can do the 5K or the 10K, it's there. But then for everybody else, I believe that accessibility is the key. 
It's not either or, it's both. B O A F. B O A F. Both. Do you you see a difference between the two types of clients, though? A lower ticket client versus (laughs) high ticket client. Yes, yes. Yes, definitely. And, and so, you know, right now, the average price of my products is about two ninety seven, right? Mm-hmm. Which is not high. It's not low. It's kind of, you know, if I don't know. Maybe that's... make an investment in yourself, you, you exactly. can be serious about it. Exactly. Because I, I notice the $30 crew, that's a different energy. That's a, that's a very different energy. Those are people who want to charge Get back. Get rich quick. They want to ask for a refund on the $20. The thir- Why are you asking for a refund and you know you got this product? Why are you charging this bag and it's thirty dollars? Got a two dollar product and they be doing it. <sighs> are you serious? It's yeah, a budget they, they disputed yeah. a two dollar charge on times like. I just can't, <laughs> and so that's Jesus. why I was like, all right, I can't hang out in this price zone too much longer because you know, I I've noticed that in order for people to really achieve change in their life, they have to do something that makes them a little uncomfortable. Got to get some right? skin in the game. You got to have a little skin in the game, right? I took my whole $1,200 and threw it into something that I had no idea was going to happen. And I'm not saying people should do that, but 200 300 it makes you think about it, right? And so if you pay, you're going to pay attention versus 30 not bad, but they might just buy it and then one day be like, I need my money back because I need to go to the mall. Well, the fuck? What are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> You know, oh it's, it's definitely. You weren't serious about this shit either. He, he wasn't serious. He that, uh, well, I see a little TikTok dude said that night motivation got you. You know, it'd be late at night. Motherfuckers be scrolling. They be right. like, I'm about to change my, my life, life, man. <laughs> I'm about to, I'm going to get on my just shit. Just smoked you a blunt. Be like, damn, <laughs> like, man. I'm ready, <laughs> yes. yes. I'm about to put the games down. I'm about to be serious. Then they wake up the next morning like, they friend hit them up. Hey, you want to go to the mall? Oh, damn. I did buy that course last night. Exactly. Let me get that back. I need that money back. Exactly. So, you know, I definitely think that there's a, there's a, there's a price that can be, you know, affordable, but you also have to be ready for what type of customer can come in that realm. And it doesn't mean that that's not a valuable customer, but you just got to be ready for what that's going to mean. And, you know, I find that no matter what the price of your product is, always over deliver because your reputation will go so much further than your price, mm-hmm. you know. And whether even if my price was ten dollars, if people buy it and they feel like they got a thousand dollars worth of game, that's that's how they know me as. Right. So then when I do raise my price to five hundred, it's like. Oh, it was about time, you know? Mm -hmm. So you always want to have that type of situation versus I paid 300 and this was shit. You know, yeah, they gave me fifteen dollars worth of value. Exactly, well, I mean, hey, Chris, but I got McDonald's. Right, because that reputation <laughs> Yo, follows that's you a too. Crazy and that, <laughs> root Chris prices for McDonald's food. Absolutely not. I'm just saying, no. dog, it happens. Um, but Ellie, we, we're about to come up to time, so we're gonna pivot. Oh wow. Well, this has been this has been a great yeah, conversation. We've been, we've been, we've been talking. Just, we've been talking. It's just been rolling. And I love it. We definitely would love to have you back on yes, the show again. We have to do a part this, two. This is great. Part two gonna have to be I'm about in to LA say we're gonna have to do it in LA. Yes, yeah, yes. on the car because. I, y'all, I still ain't got a passport. Y'all can chastise me. Y'all can, y'all can get, get on my passport. top. Oh, my nigga, we're going to do that this week. Do it Let's this do it. week. We're doing it because we, we, we some week. passportless niggas, but we ain't going to be no more. <laughs> but um, no. So to get into the last questions of the show. Yeah. Damn, boy. Oh, I'm you like pulled you. the V. I'm <laughs> you. <laughs> you oh, forgot. no. Okay, I got my question back. Uh, <laughs> he, forgot. he got three questions he asked, and I got one question I asked. I oh, okay. blanked for a second. <laughs> Um, so what's a personal finance tip or principle that you live by that you like to share with our audience? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, now what I live by is invest in yourself before you spend money on anything else. And, and, and I'll break it down. Right. Mm -hmm. So now what I do whenever I want to go buy something nice or designer, right? Cause I like designer bags. I like designer things. But I make myself go create another stream of income to afford it. I could afford it right now. I really could go buy anything that I want, but that's not going to keep me wealthy and that's not going to teach me discipline. So, for example, that Christian Dior bag over there, before I bought it, I I saved it on my phone. I said, I'm going to buy this, but I'm going to create another income stream for it. And so I bought my semi truck. 
And so my semi truck got on the road and started to make me about three to four thousand dollars passively. And my first monthly check of four K, I bought that bag. Creating assets to fund the liability. Exactly. And so, you know, not everybody can do it on that scale as quickly. But Mm -hmm. just what I mentioned, if you get that $10,000 line of credit and you take a portion of it and you get one vending machine, that vending machine can make you $1,000 a month. Always create the income and then go use the income to buy the things that you want. But if you buy the things that you want and put the income last, you're going to run out of income. Mm. But these these things, these Fendi, these these are never going away. But money can absolutely disappear if you don't take care of it the right way. So I always make sure I invest in that and myself creating another income stream and then splurge. Okay, so I got my three questions. You kind of already answered. Okay, (laughs) are you frugal or are you a flexor? (sighs) I think I'm pretty frugal. Like I flex. But I don't flex as much as like for what I feel, what I earn and what I've seen people who earn what I earn, how much they flex. I don't flex like that. I flex in assets. Like I like to buy houses. Okay. Oh, I like that shit. I like to buy houses. That's that's, that's a good flex, huh? Hell yeah. That's a good flex, exactly. So yeah, I flex like that. But in the other ways, I'm frugal. But I flex on the assets. Second question. How are you building your legacy for your kids? What is your path to leave that wealth for them? Wow. So my kids are everything to me, as you can imagine. And some of the things that I do are I hire them into my business. So my kids, they work for me. But the reason for that is so that I can open a custodial Roth IRA for them. Mm -hmm. So the earned income that they make goes into a custodial Roth. And every year... Um, I try to max that out on their behalf That's and like 12,000, 6,000. 6, yep. So my oldest is eight. Now we started when he was about seven. And if we keep this up when he's 19, there will be almost half a million dollars in that account. And my youngest is three. So by the time they're, those are my twins. By the time they're 19, you see, mm-hmm. so I'm doing things like that. I've also made sure to get, Um, like whole life policies for them, things that they can have when they're 100 at the same price as right now when they're three years old. That was really important to me because life insurance is so powerful. And it's not, you know, it's not about when they pass away, but it's about being there to fund their life. They will always be able to borrow from this policy, right? Life insurance, not death insurance. That's exactly what it is. People got to really pay attention. Life insurance is meant to be used when you're alive. They just don't teach us that. Mm -hmm. But wealthy folks, a.k.a. white folks, have been using life insurance. Life insurance and the banks were created at the same time. It has been used... Since we were enslaved. I was about to say, they actually use it for us as a way to hedge their risk. Exactly. So we just have to learn how to play the game and do it better. So that's one of the ways I build for them. And then my goal is to get two properties per child. So I'm at four right now. So I need, I got four more to go for each one to have a home in their name. That's That's dope. My last question, you basically answered it again, was do you have life insurance? Yes. Of course. I do have (laughs) life insurance. And you know what's crazy? When I was working at my corporate job that I shared with y'all, we were a life insurance company. Mm -hmm. And I was making six figures at that job, but I had no financial literacy. I was spending all my money. I had two cars, like living in the nicest apartment in L.A. And even at the time, as I was selling life insurance, I couldn't afford a really good policy for myself. I had life insurance, Mm -hmm. but my priorities were just all out of whack. Mm -hmm. So now I've been able to secure a really good whole life, permanent life policy for myself and a term. And it's just important, you know, not only to make sure if anything were to happen to me, God forbid, my kids would be good. But now I'm my own bank, you know, having life insurance is literally being your own bank. And we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it in in an upcoming episode. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so I definitely do. And I encourage every, especially every black person to have life insurance because that is literally how we will change our position in society. Imagine if every time one of us passed away, somebody got $3 million. Would we be dying at the rate we are dying right now? 
Shit, we the wealth, the would wealth gap wouldn't be looking like what it, it wouldn't be looking 20, like. Wouldn't be, there wouldn't be, be no be, gap. Yeah, it'd be like twenty fifty three. The network gonna be zero. My ass. Yeah. My, so we have to immediately start taking these steps right now to reverse. You know, I feel like my one of my goals in life is you know when you have a child, when y'all have kids, y'all know this, but. When the woman is in the room, one of the first packets they give you is, oh, get a car seat. Here's your first doctor's appointment, da, da, da. But there's nothing in there about financial literacy. There's nothing in there about opening an investment account for your child. There's nothing in there about getting life insurance. And a child can be insured within two weeks from their birth. I, I never knew that. that. You can have a whole life policy on a child as soon as they have a social security number, which typically takes eight days. There's nothing in there about these things. And I feel like if we recognize that from the moment we bring a life into the world and we start to look at how do we set this person up, not only to be healthy, but to be financially secure, everything changes. Mm. Yeah, this episode has been amazing, dog. (laughs) That's so why I was like, yeah. sprinkled, sprinkled it on us real Big quick. Jim Dropper. So, Jim Dropper. <laughs> Big step, huh? Yeah, yeah, I love it. I love God it. damn it. So, Ellie, I'm first, I got to say thank you so much again for thank joining you. us on the show. This has been amazing. Y'all, if y'all ain't got no value out of this, I need you to, to slap yourself, actually. <laughs> go re-listen to the shit. No, no, right. Open up your no, ears, no, right? Off, slap yourself, then re-listen to it, because you, you had something going on. Yeah, But no, there's out. a lot of good gems in there, uh, especially like from a funding standpoint, products, all that stuff. So again, thank you so much for thank joining y'all. us. Uh, can you please let the people know where they can follow you, if they yes. want to get any of your products? Yes. And then they want to try to get in contact with you. Oh, how do they apply to get into the high ticket? Yes. All of that. Um, so you guys can follow me at Ellie Talks Money and all my classes. So everything I was telling you all about business credit, opening your international Airbnb grants, you can go to my website or my academy, which is Elevated Academy, and enroll. And then if you want to work together more closely, just shoot me an email at hello at Ellie Talks Money and we'll get you situated. And I got a yeah, question. Can we do something special just for the listeners, our wealthy folks? Can Ooh. we get some type of a special promo code or oh, something? Oh, yes. In fact, I came ready. So Shh. when you guys go to the website, enter the code BWR and you will get 30% off of anything. I love it. I love it. I Can't mean, ask for nothing else. Uh, hello. <laughs> the, the family discount. But oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> for sure. So before we get up out of here, y'all, we're going to get into some house cleaning. As always, uh, make sure y'all leave that five-star rating and review I need for it. your boys. Uh, what else hit, hit that little like button. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. need you to subscribe. Hit that notification bell. Make sure y'all following up on everything that we got going on. Um, this week, we will be in Norfolk, Virginia. Oh. Uh, we are going to be speaking at the Black Diamond Weekend. So hopefully, y'all got y'all tickets. We're going to see y'all there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, also, this, this coming out Wednesday, right? Yeah. Oh wow! So yeah, we'll be there Thursday night. Uh, so if you in Norfolk, you know anybody in Norfolk or the DMV area, pull up. Seventh Annual Black Diamond Weekend is going to be an event for business owners by business owners. Going to get into some of the different things that we talked about on this episode. It's mm-hmm. going to be, I think, it's like fifty different learning tracks. So if you're not going to be in the building, you're playing yourself, and we're going to you be are. educating on personal finance as we always do. You know how we come in at BWR. Hell yeah. Um, and I also just want to say thank you to everybody who's been rocking with us from the beginning. Um, we just celebrated our four year anniversary with BWR on October 31st. So appreciate y'all so much. <laughs> We're coming up on that five year that most business owners goes out of business. I know. And we still here rocking strong. So we are beating the statistics. Uh, thank you for being In real time. Uh-huh. Thank you for being avid supporters. We appreciate that. Thanks. So until next time, my wealthy people, this is BWR, signing out. Peace.